I'm here today with Dr. Neil Barnard, who is the president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. He is the founder of the Barnard Medical Center and has written a plethora of books. I, I don't know. Do you ever sleep? <laughs> I mean, seriously. This sleep is important, and I think that we may even get to that in today's program. We are. Well, thank you so much for taking the time today. My pleasure. Glad to be with you again. We are starting a whole new series on the brain. Mm -hmm. And... It, Wow. It's based upon your book, Power Foods for the Brain, which really, really hit home. We just passed my mother. My mother-in-law just passed on because of Alzheimer's like two weeks ago. So this one really hits home yeah. with me. I mean, and, and in reading your book, I see why that she did, that she had Alzheimer's. So we're going to get into that today. So because one in five Americans between the ages of 75 and 84 are going to develop Alzheimer's disease. After 85, it's almost half. So, and frighteningly common are strokes, which can devastate our ability to speak, to move. These are really disturbing. And, and I think concerning to all the baby boomers, and, you know, I'm a product of the, the 60s, and we're seeing all these baby boomers coming into their 60s and 70s now. And, but speaking of the 60s, I grew up with the Beatles. And I love them. And I always have. And, and I love how you use this analogy with Brian Epstein, his, his relationship to the Beatles in your book. And could you explain this analogy and how we can avoid having a fateful May 27th? Yes. Well, I know it sounds pretty odd to talk about the Beatles in a book that's related to dementia. The idea was this, that the Beatles were kind of a scruffy rock band who... They sort of misbehaved on stage. They'd smoke cigarettes and eat and make fun of the audience. And they were, they were undoubtedly talented and magnetic, but they needed somebody to kind of tame them. And so in came Brian Epstein, who became their manager. And he said, okay, settle down, guys. You've got so much talent, but you need to dress properly and you need to look good on stage, all this kind of stuff. In our brain, we have the Beatles too. In, in other words, we have um, all kinds of impulses and all kinds of desires and things, but the cortex of the brain is sort of our Brian Epstein. It's the one that says, okay, we'll get what you want, but to get there, you got to settle down and be civilized and behave yourself. The problem is that when we are born, it's sort of all Beatles and no manager. Um, when you're a little baby, we cry and whine and all we want is food and, you know, and that kind of thing. But as we mature, we learn to inhibit and slow down a little bit. And then late in life, the opposite can happen where our ability to manage is lost. And then everything goes in reverse. The baby parts of us come out and our ability to manage and restrain ourselves is weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. So the idea is that if we want to stay healthy, we need to not only have a good manager, but we sort of need to keep that manager in place lifelong so that we can continue to satisfy our needs and get the things that we need and not get out of control. But I loved it. I thought that was a great analogy, mm -hmm. especially for us baby boomers. Yes, you got it. Me too. <laughs> At uh, Chicago's Rush University Medical Center, they've been tracking people and kind of teasing apart what separates those who stay healthy <clears throat> and sharp throughout life from those who don't. Could you share with us what they found? Yeah, this was the most important advance. It was 1993. The Chicago Health and Aging Project got started, and all they did was round up thousands of people, and they tracked what they ate. What did you eat for breakfast? What did you eat for lunch? What did you eat for dinner? And they looked in detail at the foods and then the parts of foods, how much saturated fat, polyunsaturated fat, and so forth. And then uh, about a decade or so later, they started publishing findings that were just so important because it, it turned out to be true that certain things were linked with a higher risk of Alzheimer's and other things were protective. And when I learned about this, it absolutely blew me away. And I thought, these, even though these tools are not perfect and science is by no means finished, we have enough information now that people can use this in planning their own meals and figuring out their own lifestyle. Is exercise only good for my heart? Will it help my brain? We have pretty fair answers to those questions right now meaning we should not wait. We need to put this information to work now. Yeah. Well, how do you develop a new memory trace? How does that work in your brain? Okay, so something happens. 
you have a new encounter, you learn a new fact. What you don't do is you don't make a new brain cell because if you had to have a new brain cell for every new fact, your brain would be enormous you, we wouldn't be able to fit in into a wheelbarrow. So your brain is very efficient. Um, what it does is it makes new connections between the, the neurons, the brain cells that are already there. And it strengthens connections. It makes new patterns. So it's sort of in the same way as you don't need a new computer and another new computer. What you need is uh, simply finding ways of making new connections in your computer. Your brain does that. And so the hippocampus, which is at the center of the brain, says, I think this fact that we just came upon needs to be remembered. And it, it discards the things that it decides you, you can safely forget. Um, because you have experiences all day long. You're driving in your car, you see a tree, you see a, a building. Your hippocampus says, let it go. But the things that are important, it then sends to the cortex, which is on the outside of the brain, where the connections are made. And the memory is then coded into in these connections or synapses between cells. So what role does sleep provide in creating this memory? Ah, sleep is so important. As people have discovered if, they did, if they're not sleeping. It, when you lie down to sleep, the, the first part of the night is when your brain engages in what's called slow wave sleep. And that's when your brain is integrating the facts or words or names of things that you acquired during the day. And I think of it as sort of like uh, people have been coming into my office throwing down articles and files all over the place. And if I could just get them out and I can take my files and organize them and take a little time, then I'll be able to find them later. So it's when sleep happens, your brain says, great, everybody's gone. Let's just take all the stuff that happened to you in the day and let's file it so that tomorrow you can find it again. And so if you didn't sleep, then you can't find anything and me your memory is really bad, especially for words and names. Now, one more thing, uh, the second half of the night, is when you're, you're dreaming, and that's REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. And dreams are often infused with funny emotions, and so that's when your brain is integrating emotions and it's integrating physical skills. So you play the violin or the guitar or you're playing tennis or golf or something. Your brain says, all right, let's go over all that again. Let's make sure that our, our, our musculature is learning from this, and let's make sure that my emotions are getting back to where they should be. And that's the second half of the night. So if you, I learned about this in medical school, there were many nights I didn't sleep because I was working in the hospital. And the whole team of <laughs> medical students, number one, we had terrible memories. We had to write down everything. And secondly, we got kind of grumpy because our emotional control was not so hot. So my feeling is sleep is integral to kind of pasting down our uh, memories and to... Um, getting back into an equilibrium. So sometimes like you're like trying to remember those things. And I've heard that term as mild cognitive impairment. Yeah. What, what is that? Mild cognitive impairment. It's not really a disease. It's a, a set of symptoms that doctors discover. And so what, what it really means is you might be your, your yourself. You might be conversing. You might be driving. You might even be managing your checkbook, but you know something is wrong. And it's especially words and names that, uh, and, and that can happen to anybody, but if it's happening every day and throughout the day and it's significant lapses, that's when doctors would call it mild cognitive impairment. In some cases, it's a stepping stone to Alzheimer's. It's the first sign that something is amiss. In other cases, it just doesn't progress. Well, that's what I was going to say. Is can you tell whether their mild cognitive impairment is going to turn into something more serious? Is, no. is there a test? There are tests that, that doctors will use, but by and large, it's really hard to know. And you're going to basically find out over time. There are blood tests. There is, because there are beta amyloid plaques that form in the brain, these are like little microscopic meatballs between the brain cells doctors will test for something called beta amyloid 42. And if it's low in your blood, that's mm -hmm. considered abnormal. Um, they can also look for tau, T-A-U, that's uh, a protein that's in the brain. And when it rises in the blood, that's a sign there's something disordered happening in the brain. So, so they can do these tests. They can tell you if something is going a bit squiffy. For my, from my standpoint, I don't really feel that the science is finished. Yet, it's, we're, we're not with the brain where we are, say, with 
high cholesterol predicts heart disease, for example. But but uh, we'll get there. Okay. Well, let's let's discuss the elephant in the room. What is Alzheimer's disease? What are the symptoms? <clears throat> yeah. Well, Alzheimer's disease, as you said at the beginning, is really a tragedy, um, and it's not. And just, a huge cost. Oh and, my and God. It, it, yeah, and an enormous cost. And you, you make a list of all the diseases you don't want. And this is at the top of the list because you have lost absolutely everything. You've, you've lost your connection with your family, with your friends, with yourself, yeah. with your ability to care for yourself. And you're busily bankrupting your family. And life yeah. it has lost its meaning. But it, it's, it's several things. You see problems with learning and remembering. So... Whereas earlier in life, you could remember a phrase, you could remember a word, somebody you met, you know their name. Now these things just aren't sticking. And it's not like you can't come up with it. It just didn't get into your brain at all. And things that you did know before are harder to retrieve. Problem solving and reasoning out things out is, is harder and harder. Uh, we see problems with what are, what's called visual spatial ability. So I could give you a piece of paper and say, draw a face. And can you get the eyes in the right spot and the nose and the mouth? That, that's visual spatial ability. That can go wrong. And finally, personality can change, where you have a person who all their life they were funny or peaceful or whatever it is, and suddenly they're different. They're a different person. And this is when the, your Brian Epstein is gone. And you're now it's uh, some more primitive things are starting to come out. Yeah. Wow. Well, if we could do like an autopsy on somebody who had Alzheimer's, because you don't want to do that while no, they're no, alive. No, no, no. <laughs> so what would you find? What would they see inside somebody with an Alzheimer's? Brain? Well, Dr. Alzheimer, way back more than a century ago, found certain characteristic findings that doctors still look for. They're microscopic. When you look at inside the brain and you see what I mentioned earlier, these beta amyloid plaques, take a sample of brain tissue, you slice it really thin and you stain it and you put it under a microscope. And in between the brain cells, you see what looks like tiny little meatballs, just these little round spheres. And those are made of amyloid protein that has clumped together. That's, those are between the cells. Then inside the cells, there are normally what are called these tau proteins that I mentioned earlier, TAU. They stabilize parts of the architecture inside the cell but now they are not working right. They are getting tangled up. And so the tangles are in the cells, the plaques are between the cells. That's what doctors look for. They find them, they'll say, we know what this is. This is Alzheimer's disease. Wow. You mentioned that with somebody with Alzheimer's disease has, has lost brain cells. Yeah. I mean, do these cells die? What about the synaptic connections that are between Right, them? okay, great point. When Initially, the brain still looks like a brain, but as time goes on, the connections, the bridges from one cell to the next are being destroyed. And then the cells themselves do start to die. And so the brain actually becomes shriveled up. It's like a cauliflower that is just drying out and shrinking. So that if you could compare it to what it had been before, the brain cells are dead. N not, not all of them. And you and I have talked before how certain functions like music recognition will persist, whereas word recognition is one of the first things to go. So different parts of the brain die off at different rates, and it can be different in different people, but you, you see this measurable shrinkage, which is really quite shocking to see. And it suggests to me that if we're gonna have an intervention, you want to intervene w very early, because when the brain cells are dead, they're not coming back. Yeah, once, once they go, that's it. That's right. it. That's it, right. Wow. You discussed there was a genetic component to Alzheimer's disease. First, let's discuss, first of all, what are genes? What does that mean? What are alleles? And what are the type, type the top common three? Alleles? Okay, great. All characteristics are coded in your DNA. And a chromosome contains your DNA. And you have many, many chromosomes. And for each pair within your chromosomes, you got one from mom and one from dad. And so if mom gave you brown hair, or the brown hair gene, and your dad gave you the blonde hair gene, brown is... No, my dad gave me the nose. Ah, that was well, it. There you go. The nose. Thanks, dad. Now you're, now, Thank you. Now your mom had an idea for a nose too, and you got, you got her genes, but your dad's one, your dad's might have been a little dominant, so there you are. So 
So for every gene, you, you get one allele from mom and one allele from dad. An allele is, is half right. a gene. In some cases, one is dominant. In some cases, it's not. So with there, there are lots of, of different genes for brain function and for behavior. But the ones that we're really concerned about are what are called APOE. It's capital A-P-O-E, APOE. And there are three of these uh, different types of alleles that doctors are going to talk with you about. Um, and the one that's possibly even protective against Alzheimer's is called E2 or Epsilon 2. This isn't necessarily a great thing, but it does seem to reduce your risk of Alzheimer's compared to the av population average. It might increase your risk of some other problems like cardiovascular disease, or at least these are associations we're seeing. The What I might call the normal one is, is called E3 or Epsilon 3. And if you got Epsilon 3 from mom and that one from dad, uh, your risk of Alzheimer's is pretty low. The bad one is E4 or Epsilon 4. If you got it from mom, your risk is tripled. If you got it from mom and, yeah, wow. if you got it from mom and dad, in other words, you got two copies of E4, your risk is 10 or 15 times. Your risk of developing Alzheimer's wow. is 10 to 15 times bad for other people. Um, now, I hasten to add, genes are not destiny. Um, the, you knew that was well, coming. <laughs> well, I can read your mind. The genes for blue eyes are dictators. They are, you're going to have blue eyes. But the genes for Alzheimer's are not dictators. They're more like committees. They're going to say, you could get Alzheimer's if, and it's like genes for diabetes. You know, there, there are genes for diabetes, but they, but if you exercise, you change your diet, a person follows a vegan diet, their risk of, of diabetes goes down. And we believe that's also true for Alzheimer's. Wow. Yep. So if I don't have this gene, does this mean I'm not going to no, get it? No, it doesn't mean you're not going to get it. It just means your risk is much, much lower. Okay. Well, what about vascular dementia? What What are the common causes? What is this and what are the common yeah, causes? Yeah. Well, vascular dementia, vascular means blood vessels, vascular vessels. You have blood vessels that go to your brain. Your brain is a big user of everything in your blood supply, especially oxygen. And so if your blood supply is compromised, you can have problems with brain function and it can take many different forms. You can have diffuse narrowing of the arteries um, you can have, I, I, I guess probably what everyone is, is aware of is um, stroke, uh, which yeah. can occur in different ways. You can have a clot that gets lodged in the brain and you can have narrow, uh, arteries narrowed by atherosclerosis, or you can have a break in a blood vessel that causes bleeding into the brain. So the brain is a very fragile little organ in this delicate little skull that needs you to treat it really, really well. But vascular dementia is very common. I should say though, many people have said, okay, Alzheimer's is over here, vascular dementia is over here, completely separate. I now think of them as interacting with each other because all the things that seem to protect the blood vessels, lower cholesterol, for example, also seem to protect against Alzheimer's. So I don't see these categories as being entirely distinct. Okay. Well, how can you tell, like, let's go back to a stroke. What is a stroke? How can you tell if you're about to have one? I mean, is there any warning? Is there any signs coming up? And, and if you do have one, what impact can it have on the body? Yeah, stroke means part of the brain is dead. And I, you want to limit that damage uh, because it can happen quite suddenly. And so when a person has a sudden change in their neurological status, that is the time to call 911. And it can be a sudden loss of visual function or a sudden loss of motor function. In some cases, it's a, you have a splitting headache. I don't mean a tension headache, I mean an off the scale headache. When in doubt, take it seriously. Because when you get to the hospital early, they can treat you with various things. They can look into the brain and see what's going on with various kinds of scanning technology and you don't wanna be sitting at home when this is happening. Wow. What, what are Lewy bodies and what do they indicate and is there a connection with Alzheimer's? Um, Lewy bodies, um, Lewy, L-E-W-Y. Uh, there was a, a researcher named Lewy, L-E, that was his last name, L-E-W-Y, and found these bodies inside brain cells. They're inside the brain cells in Parkinson's disease, the, the movement right. disorder that um, Michael J. Fox has been uh, 
great advocate uh, for, and Muhammad Ali had as well. It's, uh, a, 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 there is a, a diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies, and it's a little bit different from Alzheimer's. You see changes in alertness. So instead of being alert, it, your alertness can kind of come and go. You'll see disordered movements. People can hallucinate with it as well, which is um, not something we typically see with Alzheimer's disease. Well, what about frontal temporal dementia? What is this and what impact does it have on the body? Yeah, what we're talking about with frontotemporal, we're, we're talking about the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, and what's, I guess a couple things are different. One is the age. You can see this much earlier. You could see this in the 50s. Uh, it's, it's not terribly common, but you do see it in the 50s and the 60s. And what's also a little bit different is that the, the presentation is a bit different from the just sort of forgetfulness that you see with the early stages of, of Alzheimer's disease. You could see language pro- problems, forming words, uh, language abnormalities, also emotional problems where people have trouble containing their emotions and the, the youthfulness of the presentation and this somewhat unusual symptomatology will typically lead to that diagnosis. Wow. Well, you got me scared now. So yeah. let's let's talk about what we can do to change this. What are some of the steps that we can do right here, right now to protect our brain? Well, to tell you the truth, I, the reason that I wrote Power Foods for the Brain is because there are things that you can do. And it is, it, 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 there's, there's a lot you can do. First of all, you could, a person could change their diet. And because the Chicago researchers made some incredible breakthroughs that have also been replicated by other people looking in um, other cities and other other areas. And so by changing our diet, getting away from bad fat, saturated fats, trans fats, uh, certain metals can play a role, iron and copper. And we can talk about where they are and how they can attack the brain. But there are also things that are protective. Uh, Vitamin E can be protective. There are certain other parts of plant foods that are protective. Lacing up our sneakers, exercise seems to play a role. There is some evidence that intellectual exercises can help, although there's some evidence that, that, that maybe it doesn't. Uh, we're, we're still not 100% sure there. But physical exercise, very much. Changing our diet is good. Don't forget, 10 o'clock at night, go to sleep. Let the brain recover. Um, so these are all things that a person can do. And I believe that in the same way as you might have heart attacks in your family, but if you change your diet, you change your, your exercise patterns, you put out the cigarettes. If a person has diabetes, they control that or they improve it. Maybe they can get it to go away. You can protect the heart to a huge degree. The same is true for the brain. That when we put these steps to, to work, I believe that we could probably prevent somewhere on the order of 70 or 80% of cases of Alzheimer's disease. Now, that's my estimation. We need to go out there and prove it and see. But what we have to not do is to just assume it's old age, it's genes, that's it, I'm not gonna do anything different. If we put what we know to use, then we will know just how powerful it is, and I am convinced that it's the new frontier of science right now. That's awesome, awesome. Well, in our next series, we're gonna be putting these power foods to work. Foods that are gonna shield you from the toxic metals and how we can change that. Great, great, It's, it's so empowering. It is. Oh my gosh. I wish my mother-in-law had had known this. I would turn back the clock very gladly because I think of my parents, I think of my grandparents and other people. We can't do that. But what we can do is protect ourselves, those, those uh, who are our own loved ones, and for the next generation, instead of the risk of Alzheimer's continuing to climb, we can bring it down. Well, that's why we're doing this. Great.